I'm so delighted to be here. And I just finished reading this incredible book today. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. And um, I am, I knew, of course, I knew about you and The Revenant was so spectacular. And I think you've really outdone yourself here. I think this is even better. And not only that, I was just telling my husband right before we, we got on that I think this ha has another movie written all over it. So I'm, I might <laughs> ask you about that you know, as we go. But Michael, um, this story, I, I, it takes place in the mid 19th century, uh, 1866. And um, it is, I had, I knew bits and pieces of the larger picture, but I didn't right. know this. So can you tell the audience what the book is about? Sure. So uh, one of the fun things to me of, of doing research and, and being a writer generally is you kind of come across these stories from, from history, especially that after you kind of get to know about them, you kind of feel like, why didn't I know this before? And I was, uh, the, I, I, I felt that way about the Fetterman fight, which is the big battle that I write about in Ridgeline. And what it's about is what at the time was the worst uh, ever military disaster in US history. And in, and in fact, it was uh, the, the worst disaster until about 10 years later when the Little Bighorn battle took place and Custer and, and his uh, men were, were all killed. But this takes place in 1866 in the Powder River Valley of Wyoming. And there's this massive battle that takes a place and the, the big leader in this is, uh, is Red Cloud and Crazy Horse is the sort of the, the battlefield leader. And what happens all before that is kind of the lead up to that where the Lakota are engaged in a running battle with the army as the army is trying to invade uh, the, the Lakota territory and build this new fort. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole, novel feels like this propulsive um, gallop. I mean, there is lots of galloping, <laughs> but it literally, also, yeah. it literally, there's lots of, there are lots of horses, um, but it feels so, it's got such movement from the beginning and you're corralling so many different kinds of, um, of stories here. You've got intimate stories of the soldiers, you have the Native Americans and their own, um, anger and bitterness at being lied to constantly and deceived and double crossed. Um, and you have you have wives who are keeping journals about what's going on. How in the world did you, first of all, how did you start to do this research? And then we'll move on toward the end. Yeah. In a little while, I'm going to ask you more about really how you pulled the stories together. Before I do that, though, let me just quickly say um, we that Michael welcomes your questions, everyone, and I hope that you'll um, put them in the in the Q and A box. And just we have we have at least twenty five minutes for questions, so um, I'm thrilled to to ask him anything that you want to ask him. Well, one of the fun things to me about writing Ridgeline, it it was a very different type of story from The Revenant, in the in the following sense. The Revenant, of course, is set in the 19th century uh, American West, but it really was, uh, for the most part, about one person who was attacked by a grizzly bear, uh, tries to survive, and then he goes out to get revenge. But it's in many ways kind of a, a one-man story. As you said, with Ridgeline, it's really a sprawling uh, cast of characters. You know, there are there's a number of the Native American characters who are critical to this, not only the, the, the particular characters, but different tribes, uh, the Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Crow. Um, uh, there is a, a very uh, complex relationship bet bet within the U.S. Army uh, the, and the, the adversary between the different uh, officers who take place in this, uh, as you mentioned. The officers in that era take, take their women uh, with them out on to the most uh, dangerous places on the frontier. They play a really critical role, not only the officers' uh, wives, but also the, the other end of the cast, the laundresses, 
for the the followers who go along with the army to to you know literally do the do the the laundry mm -hmm. so there's just kind of all of these characters who came together and and most of them are real life uh people that um was fun to kind of dig into them and think about how to the hard thing of course was who did i exclude and i'm sure you've encountered things like that with with stories that that you've written where at a certain point you kind of have to to limit down the characters in order to be able to to go in in greater depth i think readers will be really happy to know that in the end of the book you actually do something i've never seen before i i often have a historical a note at the end about sort of what what's real and what isn't but you actually list a number of the central characters and how you deviated and why you devi deviated from history um what led you to write that note well, I did something similar with with the Revenant in terms of uh, kind of disclosing the places where I had, as you as you said, kind of diverged from from what's strictly known in terms of of history. Or if I did something more radical than that, I don't do I don't diverge too much from history because this happens to be a story where I really think you didn't need to. But I also really think it's important. There's a we're we're living through a moment right now where uh, what truth is uh, seems oftentimes to be uh, confused, and I felt a an obligation even writing historical fiction to be as transparent as I possibly could be to to the readers to know uh, exactly as much as I know what is real and and what uh, was made up, and so that was a very deliberate choice including adding in a lot of the non-fictional sources that I relied upon so that readers, if they want to, can kind of go and read other books themselves and kind of draw their own conclusions. You, you have multiple points of view on both sides. You've got, you do this masterful job, I think, of showing the different approaches to battle, the way that the Indians, the, the Native Americans, you call them Indians in the book as they were known at the time, and um, fought with fear and intimidation and arrows. There was there was noise, shouting that was really intimidating, and then how the soldiers the um, had this sort of buttoned up hierarchical way about them. And I just wondered how you balanced telling this sprawling story. How did you corral this material um, so that you have this very even you really do show us both at both sides of the battle. We see both sides and uh, in in all of its complexity and uh, and nuance. Well, one of the things when I've read um, when I read historical uh, history myself, and especially about battles, that uh, sometimes I read books where they're too sort of analytical and sort of removed. And you read about the battle and it comes across as more of a kind of nonfiction account where they tell you everything that's happening when and who moves where and who does what and who dies where. And right. you learn a lot about that, but you don't feel emotionally vested. And so what I really tried hard to do is for the characters that I picked to focus on, I tried to go deeper so that by the time it got to the battle, both on the, the U.S. Army side, but also on the Lakota and the, especially the Lakota side, that the, the reader really feels, I hope, like they know the characters for good or for ill. And whatever happens to them, the, the reader is, is vested one way or the other and has that kind of emotional uh, stake in the characters. And so that's what I was aiming for. And I hope from your question that that, that, that helped, a little, that worked a little bit for you. Yeah, it did. I mean, my husband reads a lot of, he read all of Shelby Foote many years ago. Yeah. You know, he reads, he's read a lot of sort of battle uh, oriented nonfiction. And I don't as much. And I have to admit that my eyes do glaze over sometimes when you people get into the weeds. But you managed, well, I'm going to make you read um, a paragraph in a few minutes because um, I want to show. Um, the audience, what you do so well, which is to show the quotidian details of life, the small things, and how these people get along with each other. Well, I'll give an example. Um, I loved knowing the role that the women play, uh, you know, in the in the story, but also, for example, that in addition to having the soldiers marching along, and then the the 
the women behind and you've got all these cattle so that there's food right. as well. And it's this motley journey that is actually sort of undignified. I think one character comments that it's, it feels sprawling and it's slightly out of control. Um, and I had never really understood how that function, how that worked before. I love that you show those kinds of domestic details, I guess. Well, one fun bit of backstory in terms of, you know, one of the opportunities I had that's fairly unique is the, one of the best jobs I ever had is when I was a teenager growing up in Wyoming and both in, in high school and in college, I worked for, for at the Fort Laramie National Historic Site uh, for the National Park Service. And my job literally for three summers was to dress up in an 1876 cavalry uniform and uh, talk to tourists all day we fired a cannon twice a day. I, you know, marched around with the, with the period weapons. I uh, baked uh, army bread in a wood burning oven. I, I wore the the uniform and kind of, you know, know what that feels like. And it was an incredible experience to have in writing this book because I do know what that uniform, what that wool uniform feels like, uh, which was a fairly unique opportunity for 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 modern times. Interestingly, to me anyway that the army or the, the US government in the, you know, in the 1980s and well, the 1980s is when I had this job, was doing a very bad job of talking about the role that Native Americans played in terms of the Western expansion. They were though just starting to do a slightly better job about the role of women. And, and in particular, the officers, wives and the laundresses. And I learned a lot uh, then about the role of officers, wives, and laundresses, and, and really wanted to make them characters in this book for that reason. Yeah, that is so fascinating. And it, it, this book feels like it comes at a perfect time when we're looking in this kaleidoscopic way at, at these um, historical moments that have often been portrayed quite differently. Um, a friend of mine as a 17-year-old as a was a Williamsburg you know, there you actor. go. Yeah. And yeah. the New York Times the other day had a piece about how Williamsburg is actually at the forefront of change in the way that they're talking about um, reframing history and sort of trying to figure out a way to do it that um, that is more whole um, and, and that they're doing it. And I thought that was quite interesting to know, to learn about. It's it's interesting to hear that, and I haven't been back to to Williamsburg in quite a few years, so I'll be interested to see what the what their interpretation is today. When you were so okay, so in doing this and in telling the the story also from the side of the Native Americans, you know there are lots. There's a lot in the air at the moment, as there should be about sort of who who tells who's who's allowed to tell a story. I suppose who who can tell a story. I've wrestled with this a lot myself as well. What right do I have to tell a story that someone else may feel really is theirs to tell? Yeah. And I think you do, a, as I've said, a beautiful job, but I'd love to know how, how, what your thought process was as you approached that same question and yeah. also who helped you with that and how that, how that worked. Well, it's, to me, it's the most important thing about writing this book and especially in trying to get it right. And I, it's something I gave and have given a, an enormous amount of thought to. And my starting point was in part, uh, seeing the story as it was told when I was a teenager in, in college at, at Fort Laramie and realizing that the story that we told then just left out a uh, you know critical groups, including, including Native Americans. And I felt like leaving people out of the story is was the greatest sin. And I was uh, the more that I did research on this story, the more I really wanted to to include in the kaleidoscope of characters the critical Native Americans like Crazy Horse and and Red Cloud. Then, of course, having decided that I was going to tell this story from lots of different perspectives, and I write it from everyone from a German immigrant to an officer's yeah. wives to a laundress to a transgender Lakota uh, prophet. Um, the key then from my perspective is to do as much research as I possibly can, uh, including you know reading about, uh, there's some great uh, nonfiction books written by Native American authors that incorporate a lot of the oral history tradition on events like the Fetterman fight. 
And then the, the last thing I did, having done the research, is very early on, I shared an early draft with nine different uh, Native American readers from six different tribes and asked them to just read it and give me their reaction. Mm -hmm. And I got great feedback from that exercise and changed the book a lot to incorporate advice that I got uh, to, to hopefully make it better. And then, of course, at a certain point, you just have to kind of put it out there, recognizing that you won't write it perfectly and hope at that point that at least you kind of move the discussion forward. And, and that's, uh, that's kind of my long process in thinking about this and, and trying to write it in a, in a respectful and, and honest way. Um, would, could you give an example or could you, I know, I hate to put you on the spot this way, but is there something you can think of that you changed? Sure. Was, yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, I'll give an example. When I first wrote, uh, the, the introduction of Crazy Horse's character, I had him crawling up to a ridgeline to peer over and look at a, at a herd of buffalo on the other side of the ridgeline. And I wrote that he, uh, he crawled across the earth and he, he felt as, as if the earth was a living thing as he crawled across it. And one of the Native American readers said that, that he wouldn't have thought that it was like a living thing. Uh, the earth is a living thing mm -hmm. for, for Crazy Horse. And I, I thought that was a, a great insight and I rewrote it to reflect that, that insight. Um, another insight that I got from a couple of, of, uh, of readers was they, they felt that some of my dialogue between uh, Crazy Horse and his brother was a little bit too direct in how Crazy Horse taught his little brother. And he, they felt that the, the Native American tradition would be much more observational in terms of how Crazy Horse would have taught his younger brother uh, to do things like hunt. And so I adapted some of the writing that way. Those are those are kind of a couple of examples. Yeah, I noticed that. Really yeah, interesting I insights. I, mm -hmm. the, the, I, that was a moment that I thought um, you've really done research here and you know how these different people will react um, not deeply based in their own histories and their own cultures. Um, it felt, and that was part of, I think, what kept the book moving, what keeps the book moving so, so fast is that you were very differentiated. You've got, you know, the Native American perspective and you, when you're in their story, you're really feeling what they're feeling. And, and then you come back to the other side and you've got the women worrying about their husbands running, you know, going off into battle. And um, there's this way that your loyalties as a reader are constantly being uh, sort of tested. And I think that's an unusual style and it, that it works really well in this book. We're not rooting for, you know, we're really not, we're very much understanding, I think both sides, even as I think many of us might feel that the, the Native Americans have had a rough, had a rough time of it, of course. Um, so it's hard. Yeah, sorry. No, yeah, no, I was just going to say it's not, I want to stress that it doesn't feel like you're trying to be politically correct. You're trying to really um, show what it was. Well, I hope that that conveys. And the starting point, I think clearly, and I think I, I think this comes through, is the, the injustice that was done to the Lakota and the Cheyenne and the Arapaho that is the, the lead up to this incident is uh, is horrific and one of the uh, the worst incidents in our in our history as a nation and I wanted that to convey and the anger to convey and and the feeling of what it must have been like to have your home invaded in uh, on the on the foundation of that kind of injustice and so I hope that comes through. There are some villains on the on the side of the U.S. Army that I think deserve to be. From everything I can tell historically, they 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 were villainous uh, historically. But but that's not everybody on the on the uh, U.S. Army side. There were there was a whole spectrum of different perspectives, and including, by the way, uh, some people who were ambivalent, including uh, a lot of the foot soldiers who were recent German and Irish immigrants who kind of joined the army because they wanted to learn how to speak English and be employed for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden they find themselves out in this kind of remote and dangerous place. And, and to me, what's, what's fun about, about fiction, and I'm sure you find the same thing, is 
is what fiction gives you the opportunity to do is, is not just say what happened, but instead to say, what did it feel like? It's and very you, much, that's very much what you do. Yeah. Good. Cause I think you're trying, I, I want to kind of, I want people to, to know what happened, but even more significantly and what distinguishes this from a nonfiction book is how did it feel uh, for all those different characters from all those different perspectives. So that's, that's what I was aiming at. You know, you mentioned the immigrants. That was one thing that I didn't know that that many of the soldiers um, who were there were first generation immigrants. They didn't some didn't even speak English. Yep. The Germans in particular, many of them, uh, you know, would land in Ellis Island and and sign up for the U.S. Army because it was a way to get paid twelve dollars a month and uh, and learn how to speak English. And and uh, that worked out okay for some of them, but some of them also ended up again in this incredibly remote and dangerous spot. And I often imagine standing on a place like the Fetterman battlefield or the, you know, the, the, the Little Bighorn battle uh, where a lot of the soldiers were these very recent immigrants who you can imagine them, some of them realizing that they're about to die oftentimes in a quite horrific way and wondering how in the hell did they get to the place where they are. You have a lot of death in this book. And uh, one of the things that I was struck by also is that you um, you write about it so realistically. And I was wondering how you do that. I mean, you're writing about the moment of death for a bunch of different people. Um, and it never feels like it's the same thing. It's different for each of them. How did you do that? Well, the uh, the most important thing I think that I tried to do was again, have the readers have a real relationship with the characters so that none of the deaths, none of the important deaths are, are, uh, are benign or uh, I, I wanted the readers to feel the deaths very much, whether it's uh, characters that they hate or characters that they love. So that was part of it. Another part of it was I, in studying the battle, I did learn a lot about what different characters are doing at different moments. And and each of them, in many cases, are involved in very different parts of the battle, which provided kind of the, the backdrop in terms of the events uh, before they died. And so it's kind of a mixture, I guess, between that emotional and historical, hopefully erring on the side of the uh, emotional. But I was thinking that you must have also either read or talked to someone about what you what it's like to die, because it, I mean, it really did feel like you were taking us to the other side with a lot of these people. It's the very last moment that's sort of slowing down. Well, I'm, I, I, I didn't really talk to anybody about that, but I did spend a lot of time imagining that. I mean, death is such an inherently dramatic moment, obviously. And one of the things about the death for a lot of these characters is that it, it oftentimes happens quite quickly in the midst of this, of this huge and sprawling battle, but even for the ones for whom it happens uh, quickly, there usually is this moment where they kind of come to realize that, that it's about to be over for them. And I did spend some time imagining what is that, again, kind of what does that feel like? And uh, it, in, in each case, uh, I think that was a, a, different, a different moment of reckoning for the characters. Yeah, very much. Um, so we have a lot of questions, so I can't wait to get Good. to them. Um, but I wanted to ask you to read a paragraph, as I said earlier. Sure. Um, it's on page 314. And the reason uh, it's, it's a little bit more than a paragraph, it's about a minute long or so. Um, but I wanted you to read this because to me, this is uh, in, encapsulates what you do so well in the book, which is that you have this slow motion, you, everything sort of slows down, and then it pulls back to the big picture. And this is how the book operates. I think you manage this beautiful balancing act, as I said, of close detail and, and sort of giving us, giving us a real sense of the whole story. Sure, well, and just for uh, two seconds of backdrop, the character that I'm, is the main character here is, uh, is the bugler and he's a real life character. His name is Adolf Metzger and he is one of the German immigrants. He's been in the army for a bit longer. He was in the civil war, he served in the civil war and then carries through into the frontier army after the civil war, but that's who Metzger is. But I'll read the paragraph that you suggested here. It all became real when an arrow from an arcing shot buried itself in the chest of Nathan, of Nathan Foreman, a friendly man from New York City with whom Metzger often had shared his mess. 
Form and groaned at the impact, the arrow penetrating through the bone of his sternum and then driving deep into his lung. Foreman went wide-eyed in shock, dropping to his knees. Metzger sprang to his side, easing him back onto the frozen prairie. Foreman, though, began to cough, and when he did, the blood was already at his lips. All battlefield veterans of the Civil War knew instantly which wounds were fatal, as this one certainly was. Foreman knew too. His eyes went, uh, his eyes went from the arrow protruding from his chest to Metzger, terrified. Metzger knew there was nothing to say. In a manner of minutes, Foreman would lose consciousness from the loss of blood, and moments after that, he would be dead. Foreman reached out his hand toward Metzger, and Metzger gripped it tightly. There was nothing else to do, but at least he could do that. Thank you. Um, you talked earlier about how there were some sort of bad guys on, you know, the in the soldier side. Um, and I thought the character of Grummond was very interesting and his wife as well. Yeah. Um, and in a way it, it did a lot of work for you having that character and his wife because it, they were so different from other characters in the story. Can you talk a little bit about Grummond? Yeah, so Grummond, first of all, I'm somebody who doesn't mind a really bad villain, particularly if I think it's historically justified. Uh, some characters deserve nuance and some maybe less so. And to me, uh, the real life character of Lieutenant Grummond, there's a good historical documentation for, for Hack that he was kind of a, a class A asshole. And so, for example, as a matter of history, Grummond was court martialed during the Civil War for uh, killing an unarmed civilian and for pistol whipping one of his own non commissioned officers. Uh, so he has a history that uh, is, is not uh, where he does not shroud himself in glory. And that's before you get to his history of, uh, of extramarital uh, or not necessarily extramarital, but even more complicated. I'll leave that to, to people mm -hmm. to read. So I thought that he played a uh, the role that I assigned him was one that was was historically justified by the same token, his wife, uh, Francis, who's kind of the, the main uh, character among the officer's wives. I felt sorry for her because as a 19 year old, she marries this guy. She's, a, she's uh, from Tennessee. She meets Grummond at the end of the Civil War. She thinks at the time that she's gonna be taken off to live in New York City for kind of a glamorous life as an officer's wife. They go to work to go to live in New York City for a couple of months and then Grummond gets reassigned literally to the Powder River Valley, to the most dangerous remote place on the, val on the, on the continent she lands there in 1860, not land, she, she traveled across the continent on, on a wagon back, gets there in 1866 and, and discover this, discovers that she's pregnant. So, you know, it's this, it's this great setup, I think, for kind of her character, uh, e even as she's discovering all these things about her husband that uh, shows her that he's not quite the, the person that, that she thought that he was. Right. Yeah, exactly. Such a great character. All right. So we've got a lot of um, questions and let's just get started on them. So Michael Ross says, I write about the Shoshone New. Um, how did you go about making sure that the Lakota Crow Cheyenne point of view was presented? I know we've talked about that a little bit. but Yeah. So again, a, a lot of that was, was basically doing an, an awful lot of, of research and then once I had a draft, sharing it with as many different uh, Native American readers as I could to, to sort of check myself. One of the really exciting things to me is uh, one of the people who I was able to have read this is, a, uh, is the great, great, great grandson of High Backbone. High Backbone is a character in my book. He, in real life, is Crazy Horse's uncle. And so this great, 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 uh, grandson of of High Backbone is a professor today at a at a community college in in Sheridan, Wyoming, and he was able to to read this and give me feedback and and actually ended up endorsing the book with a with a blurb and it was it was things like that 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 gave me the opportunity to to really test whether or not I was I was getting things right. Great. 
Um, all right, Jennifer Becker asked, well, she says, first of all, uh, Williams, yes, it is. Williamsburg African American and American Indian programming is fantastic. Very nice. Um, and then she says, um, what is your advice for white authors who want to write historical fiction involving Native American characters? Well, I guess the starting point is is a, a lot of humility. Um, it's a it's not something that I did without an awful lot of advanced thought about whether I was doing the right thing. And as I said, where I landed is uh, the one thing I didn't want to do is leave people out of this story in a story that has uh, so many different uh, actors and and pers and perspectives. And so for me. That was the right thing. It was to to not leave groups of people out. To do my best to write those different perspectives, uh, share it and test it with as many uh, people as diverse a group of people as possible. Uh, and then at that point, I think though, put the story out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I've got something wrong, then uh, then I'm I'm open to hearing about that. And and as I said, hopefully moving the discussion forward is part. Of that exercise, but I think it's better to have that discussion than to than to push characters aside and leave them out. Right, that it, the story is incomplete without them. Without Absolutely. Them yeah. And by the way, you know uh, this this uh, this uh, book includes all sorts of characters that are different from me, as you mentioned. Uh, I, I chose to use uh, the the mechanism of of journal entries, first person journal entries. To write the character of, of Francis Grumman, which was a, a great exercise in empathy for me to, to try and write uh, a first person journal entry for a 19th century uh, woman character. Um, you know, there's a character who is a mixed race, a real life character, uh, James Beckworth, who is a mixed race uh, frontiersman whose mother was a uh, was a, a, a black slave and whose father was a white slave owner, a, a, another real life character. Uh, one of the characters, and this is also historically accurate, was a transgender Lakota prophet uh, who prophesized uh, what was going to happen in this battle and who was looked to by other members of the tribe for prophecy in exactly this type of instance. So there are lots of characters here that I thought it was critical that I included in the story because in real life, they're part of the story. And so uh, the best I could do was to try and write them all with, with respect and, and historical accuracy. This was a huge project, Michael. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> how many years did it take you? How, how, how long was it from start to finish? Um, I started working on this about four years ago um, and I, I wrote, the a first draft in about two years and then spent uh as you know the publishing industry itself is pretty slow moving yeah. uh so there was it's probably about three works three years of really active work a first draft lots of back and forth with with uh my great editors with the the outside people who gave me help and advice on on the story and then kind of a slower year before publication where the book was mostly done but the 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 publisher is doing all the things that publishers do to kind of get it ready for for releasing. Right, exactly. Great. Okay, so Michael Ross uh, says, I'm on a panel at a writer's conference in three weeks, partly about writing Native American history. You used to live in Williamsburg, just toured Fort Laramie in April, missed the tour before I wrote the book due to COVID. He says, you've mentioned Fetterman a few times. In your writing, how do you take account, um, take into account eyewitness bias, like Francis Carrington. And I know I read you, that you'd written about this, so I'm- Yeah. Well, I think there's a, a, a ton of, of, of bias from, from lots of different perspectives. And so I think the big thing is, is just reading lots of different perspectives on, on the battle. And, you know, as you mentioned, the commanding officer's wife, uh, Margaret Carrington, wrote an autobiography that, that kind of gave the commanding officers quite biased view of the battle. He actually happened to be back at the fort while the battle was taking place. And a lot of his perspective on the battle was trying to avoid being blamed. Um, the, the, some of the most interesting and I think probably best accounts of the battle came from the Native American participants in the battle. 
a lot of those though come through oral histories that were passed down through generations, but, but have been written up now, including one of my favorite books about the battle is a nonfiction book by a Lakota author named Joseph Marshall. And he writes an, a nonfiction book about the Fetterman fight that takes into account a lot of the, of the uh, oral history. So I read all those things and then uh, you know, tried to come out with what I thought was the, the fairest interpretation. Yeah, and so this is actually kind of related to that. How did you go about finding and approaching those nine native readers? So uh, I was very lucky when I was US ambassador to the World Trade Organization in Geneva to have a, a Native American uh, colleague, a guy named Keith Harper, who was another US ambassador to one of the uh, UN agencies. I got to be friends with him during that, that job. And when I had a first draft, uh, he was one of the first person that I sent it to, and uh, he very kindly read it right away. We got together for a dinner, and I asked not only for his advice, but for his advice about who else to, to share it with, and he started kind of recommending other people, and then I kind of worked my way through that process to a larger number of, of readers over the, the following months, and just kind of ended up, uh, I work uh, in, in Missoula. I have a a friend who is a, a Native American woman who teaches at the University of, of Montana, who's a writer herself. Uh, I shared it with her and just kind of worked my way through that type of a process uh, from one person to, to the next. Did you show all of them the whole book or just part or parts? I, I showed all of them the, the whole book um, and, uh, and asked for whatever time they could, could devote to it. Um, and, uh, and just, you know, as I said, kind of took the, the feedback that I received, which was, was different in, in all the cases. Some focused more on the writing, some focused more on the history, some focused more on the culture, uh, and all of that feedback was enormously helpful. Also, you know, one of the questions I asked is, is what should I be reading that I might have missed? Mm -hmm. And some of the books that I included in the back of the, in the historical note that I mentioned, are books that some of the Native American readers suggested as books that from their perspective did a good job of, of presenting the history. Yeah, I agree that um, that uh, was one of the things that certainly is true with my own research is that the more people you get to read it, the more ways of responding to it you get. And I think that's an important point that I hadn't quite thought of in that way. Well, you write um, about uh, about history as well, and so um, I'm sure you. Uh, what's your technique? Just out of curiosity, do you uh, you must do a you clearly do an enormous amount of historical research from uh, in the books that you're writing. I haven't been able to read the Exiles yet, but I'm very excited that you you traveled to Australia for uh, for that book. In some ways, the Exiles is more like Ridgeline than you know any of my other books in that it is this historical moment set in the mid 19th century, so it's quite a bit before my earlier books, Orphan Train and Peace of the World and the other ones. Um, but yeah, I, I that idea of just being a sponge for information from, from people who speak to you, who read it, who uh, you consult with. I love in the back of your book that you thank your barber who, who <laughs> told you information about, I think, cattle and uh, farming. That was just she such is, a- uh, She's yeah. fantastic. She is a, a well, she's, she's not a part-time rancher because I think you can't ranch part-time, but she's a full-time barber and also runs a ranch with her husband full-time. And so it was great because I'd go in for a haircut once a month and I would ask her all of these questions about cattle and horses. And she just, she knows about all that stuff. I think she got, she's very patient with me, but- uh, and, and a lot of her knowledge about horses and cattle shows up in this book. There's so much about horses and cattle in this book, so I can see that. But also, to me, this is a great example. That's a great example of how when you're working on a book, your life is the book and you just but you're immersed and you totally. get you get help wherever you can and you learn from people all along the way. Um, totally. This is kind of a great different kind of question. So did your parents make you um, give the tours? Or did the impulse come from you? How did you originally become interested in 19th century stories? 
Yeah. So this was, uh, well, my parents, especially my, my parents inspired me they're, and their uh, former teachers, they're, they're retired now, um, but both inspired me in different ways. My dad is a, was a biology, high school biology teacher and an avid uh, outdoorsman and fisherman hunter. And he really introduced me to the, to the, to the natural world in a way that has inspired me since I was a very little. And my mother uh, is a taught, uh, taught elementary school and she is a reading fanatic and history fanatic. And she really inspired me on the history front. So they didn't have to push me to this job at all. In fact, it was a couple of my junior high history teachers who worked during the summer at Fort Laramie doing living history interpretation that has had suggested that it might be, they knew of my interest in history and suggested that I volunteer out there. And I started out there as a volunteer and then ultimately worked into a paid job with the park service. But it was a combination of my parents and these and these uh, public school teachers of mine. And your and your own interest, it sounds like. For sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that interest is, uh, I've always loved Western American history since a very, very young age. Yeah, it's, you're sort of steeped in it. Yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, I like this world for sure. Yeah, um, and you, and you make it very, you make it very interesting for people, which is wonderful. Well, okay, thank so you, I hope that's true. So Victor, whom you may know, uh, Victor Morazka Mar 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 says- my, my former colleague, excellent. Ah, Victor. okay, <laughs> great. So Victor says, hi, Michael, no Marvel questions, I promise. Um, <laughs> Do you have any intention of revisiting one of your earlier book ideas, i.e. man from the upper plains goes to Washington and changes the way it works? <laughs> we miss you in DC. Uh, uh, well, Victor is talking about an embarrassing uh, incident from my past. I, I originally tried, the first book I ever tried to write was loosely based on somebody who was kind of like me in modern times who went to Washington, DC and becomes involved in a series of, of adventures. And about, after spending a couple of years working on that book, loosely based on my life, I showed it to a, a friend of mine who told me that it sucked. And, uh, and that, was, uh, that was painful in part because that was the fictionalized version of my life. Uh, but it was right about that moment when I came across the story of, of this frontiersman in, in the 1820s who was mauled by a grizzly bear and uh, abandoned by his colleagues and went out to seek revenge. So I abandoned the old story and have no intention of going back to it. I think I'll stay in the 19th century yeah. going forward. <laughs> Do you think you'll stay in the 19th century? Uh, probably. And I mean, there's so much of it that is compelling to me. And, and by the way, one of the things I love about the 19th century, and I hope about all the stories I write about, is I think they have so many important contemporary lessons. And so... And frankly, I think we're in such a uh, in such a divided nation right now that sometimes by stepping back to the to the 19th century, you can grapple with issues that if you tried to to write about them in contemporary times, you would immediately kind of alienate half the country. Whereas if you put if if you put a story in the 19th century, people are a little bit more willing to to kind of wade into it with a slightly more open mind. That's my hope. Uh, I, I think, uh, but I, but I believe that. Well, every answer you give me is inspiring me to ask a million questions, but I'm going to continue with their questions. And then if we have time at the end, I have some more for you, um, on, on that, on that subject. Uh, okay. So Jason Freeman asks, can you talk about the specific types of research you did for the book? Do you rely upon first person accounts or specific larger historical texts? So, uh, I read a mixture of kind of broader histories of the, of the era and of the, the main characters. I read biographies of all the, the major characters, whether it was Crazy Horse or Jim Bridger or James Beckworth. Uh, so I read those biographies, the broader histories. And then I did an awful lot of, of on the ground research at the site of the fort and the battlefield itself and had wonderful uh, uh, days spent walking the entire back battlefield, which is a sprawling physical space in this beautiful part of, of Wyoming, and really trying to get a feel, not only for what it looked like, but also for 
some of the mysteries of the battle in terms of you know where particular things might have, have happened. So it was it was that mixture of of all those things. That's great. Uh, okay, so Mason Waller asks, I'm wondering your thoughts around the implications of telling marginalized people's stories in two ways. First, I'm wondering, did writing this engage you with your own biases, whether in subtle or dramatic ways that you want that you wanted to shift the writing specifically to benefit the reader, I believe. And it seems to me that appropriation isn't just about who gets to tell stories, but who benefits from telling them, including financially. Thoughts? Yeah, so I think that's, I think that's fair. And you know, certainly as somebody who, who makes their, their living in part from writing, um, you know, I, I hope to, to make a, a living from, from, from this book. But uh, you know, some of the of the proceeds from this, uh, I, I've donated donated to a couple of of Native American charities that I think do really good work, particularly in, in the area of, of of Native American education. Um, and as far as the you know my own bias, biases go, uh, I hope that the more that I've learned about this era, the the more. Uh, I guess aware and open-minded I've become, and you know it's pretty hard to study this era, and in particularly, in particular the the way that the U.S. government treated the the uh, various tribes in terms of of going back on promises that it made and betray the betraying those promises. And so uh, I've become, I hope, much more knowledge, uh, knowledgeable about that as part of this process. And I hope that comes in the book. Yeah, it, it would be interesting to talk to that person after they read it. I, I think they'll be, I think they'll be pleased. Um, okay, Michael Ross says, Grumman definitely was an asshole, a bigamist. <laughs> Can't wait to see how you roast him. Um, and then Jason Friedman says, lots of death, an incredible villain, a brutal war between an expanding US and indigenous people, and finally drawn real life and imagined characters. Is this book at all in the literary tradition of Blood Meridian, or maybe just gives it a small tip of the hat? That's interesting, because when I was reading this, my husband was talking about Blood Meridian last night and sort of wondering about that, but I have not read Blood Meridian, believe it or not. So I don't... Uh, I, I admire that book very much. I think uh, he has a very different style from mine. Um, you know, I'm probably more influenced by a slightly more traditional story, storytelling style, somebody uh, uh, like McMurtry, for example. Yeah. Uh, I admire his, his style of, of telling stories. Um, and I hope, you know, when I wrote The Revenant, I think when you're just starting to write that you you probably imitate other people a lot more than kind of finding your own voice. I hope 20 years later that I've got a voice now that's a little bit more of my own in terms of a style of storing of storytelling that I'm most comfortable with. And so, you know, I'm not I'm not sure exactly where I fit into that, but uh, but those are some of the writers who I respect for sure. Yeah, I can see that very much. Um, I'm going to circle back quickly to the to the series or film or movie question. Um, have you had any interest in turning this into a screenplay or or working with it in in a cinematic form in some way? And how? What are your thoughts on that? Very much so. And one of the exciting things that's that has happened is uh, Ridgeline was optioned by a company called Anonymous Content, that is the same company that produced The Revenant. So we'll see what happens. It took a long time for the Revenant to to get made, and so I'm not uh, I'm 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 not holding my breath while I wait. But I I do love the idea of this story being told in that in that cinematic style, whether it's a a film or some type of a of a scripted series. I would it would be fun if something like that would happen for sure. It took a long time, but that book. I mean, sorry, that movie was such an instant classic that um, it seems to me that, that there would be a lot of energy around it. I can see that. 
I, I hope so. And uh, anonymous content is a is a great creative partner. So um, I'm excited that that they've picked this up. That's great. Congratulations. Um, so LK asks, are there any periods of history that interest you that you haven't focused on yet, but would like to? Um, well, in the 20th century, or I'm sorry, in the 19th century uh, of the American West, I've written about the fur trade era. I've written about the, the Indian Wars now. I've written a couple of nonfiction books focus more on the mining era and about the birth of the conservation uh, movement at the end of the, of the, of the uh, 19th century. But uh, there's a bunch of other parts of, of the 19th century history of the American West that I'm uh, ex you know, interested in, whether it's uh, you know, the, the families that were immigrating West in especially you know, between kind of the, the 40s and the and the 60s, that to me is a fascinating topic, the idea of putting your family in a wagon and literally walking across the continent to try and start a new life. That to me is pretty compelling. I'm interested in the cattle ranch era, uh, including in places like, like Wyoming. To me, that's incredibly dramatic. I, I did a lot, I wrote a screenplay about Charlie Russell, one of the most famous and to me impressive of the, of the Western artists. He writes very much about that kind of cowboy era of especially Montana. So there's a bunch of eras like eras like that 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 I think are 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 rich in terms of story potential. Have you got a, a, a new idea that you're working on specifically? Nothing that I'm married to yet. I mean, I'm sure you know how much you kind of walk up to that because when you really marry an idea, you know what like a big that, commitment it is. It's you are married and you better be all in. And so I'm I'm courting a bunch of ideas, but I'm not I have I'm not married to any of them yet. <laughs> That's very exciting. We have got our timing is so great because we only have one more question. There are three minutes left. And so um, this will, I think, close us out. But um, Michael Ross says it's interesting about the divided nation. That's what I wrote about in my first book and the series Across the Great Divide. I had similar experiences getting Native American input, endorsement by the Shoshone. Is it Shoshone? Or Shoshone? Shoshone. Yeah. Would you ever write about a female MC in the 19th century? Maybe someone like Mary Fields, he asks. That's uh, interesting. It's not, that's not a, a specific topic uh, that I've thought about writing about, um, but I'm, as I said, I'm quite open-minded and I love the, I think the, the 19th century American West is a lot more diverse than, than people realize sometimes in part because it was told for so long as kind of a white male, you know, cowboys and cavalrymen kind of way. And so I, I hope that, you know, one of the things that Ridgeline does, for example, is, is uh, underscore how much more diverse that, that story was of, of the Powder River Valley in 1866, for example. That's good. All right, I'm, I am gonna ask you one more question because I actually really wanted to know the answer to this. So when you were writing the pivotal battle scene, that amazing scene that takes place over how many pages? It's, it's I wrote it long, it's about a hundred pages of the book. Like a hundred pages of this 330 page book, 350 page book. Um, I wondered if you had charts, if you had maps on walls, how in the world did you keep track of all of that action coming from, it was from so many directions. Yeah. So I'm a big whiteboard, draw on whiteboard uh, person for outlining purposes. And uh, I don't know how, about, how, how you do it, but for me, I've got three or four big whiteboards around, uh, some with pictures, one with pictures stuck to it, one with little yellow sticky tabs of my different chapter outlines. And then I had one in this case with a hand-drawn map that I had kind of drawn myself from different uh, actual maps that I had found and did kind of exactly what you're describing. I used multiple colored magic markers to literally 
try and draw in where different groups were coming together. And for me, that was the only way to keep track of it, because as you say, otherwise, it's such a complex physical story, and it takes place across uh, this sprawling space. And so that was my, there's, there's a, a, a really pretty map in the front of the yes. book that was drawn by uh, somebody that the publisher hired that is a much prettier version of what was scratched on a, a, a whiteboard in Magic Markers by me. Well, you know, this event tonight with the Philadelphia Library reminds me, I, I've been thinking so much about Eric Larson because we, we're really good friends and we've done a number of events together, but we met because we were in person one night after the next at the Philadelphia Free Library and we had a drink at midnight at the Ritz bar, as I recall. Um, but I was thinking when you were just saying that about his last book about Churchill and the way he had to amass all of these things that were happening at the same time. And I really do want to stress to people as we, as we head out tonight um, that you have done the way, I think the way Eric Larson does, um, this incredible job of taking what in other hands would be dry and data filled and, you know, sort of strategic kind of um, planning and you've turned it into this flesh and blood story that is just riveting. And so I just, again, I wanna congratulate you on that and encourage everyone to read the book as quickly as they can. Well, thank you for that. I especially appreciate that coming from you. And uh, I'm a big admirer uh, of Orphan Train and excited about reading The Exiles. And I, I, I feel like you have a, I take that as a big compliment from you because I love how you present historic stories in a way that, that feels uh, vivid and exciting. So thanks for that. Well, thank you, Michael. And have a great time on this virtual tour. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited to see this book just, you know, percolate through the world. Thanks so, again. Appreciate and thank it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um,